This work is a parody of Dan Carlin's Hardcore History Podcast. Mr. Carlin is not associated with this production, and any views or opinions presented in this podcast are solely those of Alex Berg and Jason Green. The other night I was watching Terminator 2, Judgment Day. You know, I'll be back and all of that. And it's a great movie that I hadn't seen in a while. And I had forgotten that scene towards the end when the, uh, uh, what's his name, the, the evil Terminator, the T-1000. Well, I, I had forgotten the scene where the T-1000 crashes into the foundry and gets soaked with liquid nitrogen. And then Schwarzenegger says that, that just that great line, uh, hasta la vista, baby, and fires his gun. And the T-1000 just explodes into hundreds of little pieces of... Well, in the movie, it was some sort of future metal, but I believe in real life it was Mercury. Anyway, this future metal stuff is just scattered all over the floor. Hundreds of little blobs everywhere. And then one tiny piece touches another tiny piece, and they merge together to make a slightly larger piece. Then a few of the other small pieces do the same thing. And now they're big pieces too, and so on and so on, until pretty soon there aren't hundreds of pieces of metal. There's one piece of metal. And the T-1000 has put himself back together again, like some kind of murderous Humpty Dumpty or something. I mean, I I just, I love that scene. And, you know, when I was watching it, it reminded me of something that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Then yesterday, I was just puttering around the house when it hit me out of the blue, which is how these things always seem to happen. But what it reminded me of was Westeros. Or more specifically, the history of Westeros. Now, putting my connection to the movie aside for a moment, I think it's safe to say that the history of Westeros is fascinating stuff. And at the same time, it's also a complete mess. First off, you've got a landmass the size of South America with thousands of years of recorded history. A history that includes dragons, winters that last decades, magic, hundreds of kingdoms, thousands of wars, an army of... Well, they don't even know, they just call them the others, but things they still haven't been able to explain. And not only that, every house with a banner worth remembering has their own perspective on what the real history is, and all you know for sure is that those perspectives are biased in favor of whatever house wrote them. You put all that stuff together, and you've got a historical landscape that's just incredibly complicated. Take ancient Rome, pump it full of political steroids, stretch it out for a few millennia, and you've got a pretty good idea of what we're dealing with in Westeros. So it's no wonder that a lot of people, when they try and figure out how to tackle the history of Westeros, well, no matter how they look at it, no matter which way they approach it from, it's it's almost impossible to know where to start. It's sort of a historical Gordian knot. Now, the way I approach it is, and, and you know, keep in mind that this is only one way to look at it. I'm not suggesting it's the only way or the best way. It, it's not our Alexander sword or anything like that. But the way that I wrap my head around the history of Westeros is by focusing on the history of all those kingdoms I was talking about. There used to be hundreds of them scattered up and down the entire continent. And they were always fighting, too. I mean, one kingdom would fight another kingdom, and then afterwards, most of the time, nothing really changed, but sometimes one of them would get a little land from the other one, or some people, or maybe some fertile farmland, a valuable mine or two, or something that made it just a little bit stronger. And then maybe a few years would go by, and the two kingdoms would go to war again, only now one of them stronger than the other one, because of all the goodies it got the last time around. So this time, it wins the war, and it absorbs the weaker kingdom into itself. And when you start going down through the centuries of Westerosi history, you see that scenario, or some version of it, happen time and time and time again. Until after a while, where once there used to be hundreds of kingdoms, all of a sudden there are just a few dozen. And then a few more centuries go by, the bigger kingdoms eat the smaller ones, and those few dozen get whittled down to seven. And then that holds for a while until pretty soon there aren't hundreds of kingdoms, there's just one kingdom. Remind you of anything? Now, in the movie, the reason that all those little blobs of future metal were attracted to each other, well, well, in the movie, it's because they're part of a larger robot consciousness or something. I I don't know. You'd have to ask James Cameron. But there is no larger robot consciousness governing Westeros, now is there? Instead, what pulled all those kingdoms together was the pursuit of power. And to me, that's the through line for the entire history of Westeros. That's how you can sort of contextualize those thousands of years of history. Because from the second that human beings step foot on Westeros, the pursuit of power has driven just about everything they've done. And back in the early days, power was sort of an easy thing to quantify, right? 
I mean, if you're one of the first men on Westeros and you've got a sword and the other guy doesn't, well, then you've got all the power. But as time goes on and civilization starts to take hold, you notice that the concept of power in Westeros, well, well, it starts getting a little difficult to define. I mean, if you've got a sword, but the other guy has 400 acres of grain-producing farmland, well, who has the power then? What if you had two swords, or a hundred, and they don't have grain but milking cows and ships and technology? Well, you could go back and forth all day, tweaking either side to make it equal. But the real point is that power is just a matter of perception, right? Power lies wherever people think it lies. Well, that's sort of an abstract concept, but there's an old riddle that illustrates the point quite nicely. I I first read about it in the works of Westerosi scholar Meister Martin. Now, I should say that normally for an episode like this, I'd consult 30 or 40 separate sources, but this is kind of like the situation you've got with Genghis Khan. Almost everything we know about the man comes from the secret history of the Mongols, and almost everything we know about Westeros comes from Meister Martin. He's almost, not quite, but almost the only game in town. Now, Martin attributes the riddle to Varys the eunuch, and personally, I think it came from Tyrion Lannister, but then again, I'm not a historian, just a fan of history. Regardless, wherever it came from, it does a nice job of demonstrating the elusive nature of power. Quote, In a room sit three great men, a king, a priest, and a rich man with his gold. Between them stands a sellsword, a little man of common birth and no great mind. Each of the great ones bids him slay the other two. Do it, says the king, for I am your lawful ruler. Do it, says the priest, for I command you in the names of the gods. Do it, says the rich man, and all this gold shall be yours. So tell me, who lives and who dies? End quote. So who lives and who dies? Where does the power lie? Well, that's the question we'll be exploring over the course of this series, as we talk about one of the most ruthless, devastating conflicts in the entire history of Westeros. A conflict known as the War of the Five Kings. As you might have guessed, this is a story about power. People who have it, people who want it, and the decisions people are willing to make to get it. And it's also a story about the consequences of those decisions. Because as we'll see, by and large, those consequences are oftentimes fatal. After all, when you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. So long as I'm your king, it's history. Treason shall never go unpunished. The events. There's a brave men knocking at our door. The drama. Let's go kill them. The figures. When you play the game of thrones, you win. Or you die. It's hardcore Game of Thrones. Winter is coming. In order to talk about the War of the Five Kings, we have to set the stage a bit and explain the circumstances that allowed it to happen in the first place. Because, well, like everything in Westeros, it's complicated. I mean, anytime you've got five guys running around claiming they're all the king of a place, it's certainly not going to be a simple situation, now is it? Look at World War I. The system of alliances that kicked World War I into high gear is famously complicated, but at the end of the day, it still boiled down to two sides, the Allied powers and the Central powers. In the War of the Five Kings, there's five sides, obviously, and who you're rooting for in that fight depends not only on what you think about the uh, contemporary political climate in Westeros, but also what you think about all the events in recent and in some cases distant history that created that political climate in the first place. So today I'm going to talk about three events that lead to what we know as modern-day Westeros. And the first is... Well, it's sort of the big-picture view of Westerosi world history. Now, you could easily do a whole podcast about this subject. Heck, you could do an entire podcast series about it. But that's not what I'm trying to do today, so I apologize in advance to any Westerosi historians in the audience who listen to this and think that I, that I bungled the whole thing up. Yes, I know I, that I didn't mention Hugor of the Hill or the Rionish Valyrian War or a million other things, and for that, well, all I can say is I'm sorry. But if I mentioned everything worth mentioning, we'd be here all day. 
Instead, my goal is to give you, valued listener, enough information about this world so that when we do talk about the War of the Five Kings, you're not left scratching your head about who's fighting who and where they're fighting and why and how come everyone keeps saying Aegon all the time anyway. And this is a new problem for me. Because when we talk about a story from, say, Europe, for example, you probably know a lot just by default about the major players on the European stage. Because just about everyone knows the basic history and the basic geography. So if I say, it was in the summer of 1944 that England landed her troops on the shores of Normandy, you automatically understand what countries I'm talking about, and probably the war, and heck, most of you even know the day and name of the battle. But even if we were talking about an Earth-based story that you'd never heard of, after a few names got dropped, you'd probably be able to grasp the basic idea of what was going on and who was fighting who and so on. That's not the case with Westerosi Wars. And so I'm going to do my best to give you, well, I guess the Cliff Notes version of their world history and get you up to speed. Now, if you had a big map of the world of Westeros and you laid it out, you'd notice two things right off the bat. First off, you'd probably point out that there would be a whole side of the planet that was missing. That's because, given the technical limitations of the Westerosi, people simply don't know what's there. It would be like looking at a European map from 1,500 years ago and asking them, hey, uh, where's North and South America, and heck, where's Australia? They wouldn't have any idea what you were talking about because they didn't know those places existed. Same deal here. The second thing you'd notice is that the parts of the world that they do know about are made up mostly of two giant land masses. And there are lots of little islands around and some unexplored areas to the south, but really the whole known world is just two continents. One in the east and one in the west. The eastern continent is called Essos, and it's just this massive chunk of land. It's about the size of Asia, and it's actually sort of got the same shape as Asia, too. And then on the western side of the map is the other big continent, and it's got a name you're already familiar with, Westeros. You know, it's funny, as someone who's a huge fan of Westerosi history and is constantly impressed by the the gravitas and grandeur of its stories and culture, I'm always a little amused that its name is, well, kind of just the laziest thing on earth. I always imagine some king in Essos talking to his subordinates and going, uh, that nameless land to the west of Essos, from henceforth it shall be called Westeros. I mean, it's just the most on-the-ball name ever, but it must work for the Westerosi because they've never changed it. Anyway, while Essos is a long, wide piece of land, Westeros is a tall and skinny one. Imagine that someone took a continent the size of South America and stretched it out to resemble the shape of England, and you've got Westeros. Something worth quickly mentioning is that nobody is really sure where the top of Westeros actually is. The farther north you go, the colder it gets, and it doesn't get cold like, hmm, maybe I should put on a jacket cold. It gets cold like Antarctica gets cold. In fact, it's so cold and so dangerous that it's almost completely unexplored. It might as well be another country. It even has a different name from Westeros. It's called the Land of Always Winter. Sounds pretty cool, right? Pardon the pun. But getting back to the subject at hand, as far as continents go, Essos and Westeros are just absurdly close to one another. The only thing that separates the two of them is a long stretch of water called the Narrow Sea. Again, not always the most creative with their names, these Westerosi. But that's it. There used to be a tiny little strip of land that connected the two together, but it's long gone. We'll get back to that in a minute. And so now the only way to get between the two places is by ship. Now, recorded Westerosi history starts somewhere between 8 and 12,000 years before the War of the Five Kings. Historians can't seem to agree on an exact number. I tend to lean closer to 8, but the truth is that nobody really knows. However, something that everyone can agree on is that up until 8,000 years ago, there were no human beings on Westeros. All of human civilization was rooted firmly on Essos, and by that I mean there were various nomadic tribes and maybe a tiny kingdom or two, but nothing that you or I or even Meister Martin would recognize as quote-unquote civilization. Which is not to say that Westeros was empty. Just the opposite. There were thousands and thousands of intelligent creatures living there. It's just that none of them were human beings. <laughs> 
none of them were human beings. Let that sink in for a minute. We're talking about Creatures feels like it must be the wrong word, or, or at the very least pretty insulting, but I don't know what else to say. Non-human races? Is that any better? Well, if not, my apologies to all of my non-human listeners. But back then, there were two of these non-human races that called Westeros home. The first was a race of giants, a group that, you know, could sort of pass for human if they weren't 14 feet tall and covered in hair. And these must have been just incredible to see. I mean, I remember seeing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the basketball player, at an airport one time and being absolutely shocked at how big he was. And he's seven feet tall. These giants were twice that size. They were big enough to ride mammoths into battle. And not like Hannibal would ride elephants into battle with a turret to hold the human riders. Giants could just throw one leg over the side of a mammoth, grab a club the size of a tree because it was a tree, and off they'd go. Cavalry riders on steroids. They must have been quite a sight. And then there was the second non-human race, who were called the Children of the Forest. And if the giants looked like big humans, the children, well, as you probably guessed, they looked like tiny humans. They were around three feet tall. They had pointy ears. They dressed in clothes that they made from trees and shrubs and bark. And, you know, there are a few differences, but basically the Children of the Forest were kind of like elves. Or at least that's how I think of them. I'm sure some Tolkien fans in the audience can tell me how exactly I'm wrong. But until then, I'm going to keep thinking of them more or less as elves. So if you hear me use that term, no, I don't really mean elves. I just mean children of the forest, and I'm not particularly great on the finer points of non-human anthropology. Now, during this time, things in Westeros were pretty good. You know, I'm sure that the giants and the children would argue every once in a while, but by and large, they seem to have gotten along. If not well, then okay at the very least. As far as I know, no big wars, no genocides, or anything like that. Which isn't too hard for me to believe, because really there wasn't that much for them to fight over. I mean, neither race built anything, there were no cities or roads or anything like that, and neither of them tried to accumulate personal wealth either, so nobody's going to war over gold mines or valuable trading ports or anything like that. It just didn't happen. Instead, the children of the forest had a culture that seemed to be focused on achieving a symbiotic relationship with nature, while the giants were apparently very happy to just lumber around, smashing things and looking for stuff to eat, and then smashing some more things. Very giant-like behavior. In fact, the only thing that the children seemed to have built that they actually valued were these faces that they'd carve into a type of tree called a weirwood. And they're still around today. If you're on a walk and see a weirwood with a face on it, that's called a heart tree. I've seen a few before, and they're really very impressive. A bit spooky, though. The trees are bone white and have this explosion of red leaves that look just like blood, but impressive nonetheless. Evidently, the children worshipped these heart trees, or at the very least, considered them an important part of their communities. And as far as I know, the giants never messed around with them. So, again, my point is that things were, by and large, pretty peaceful on Westeros because nobody was competing for anything. That all changed around, uh, let's just say, 8,000 years ago when human beings from Essos started crossing over that little strip of land that I told you about earlier that connected the two landmasses together. It's actually a lot like what happened with the Bering Strait when nomadic tribes crossed over into the Americas from Asia. A group of nomads, probably an ethnic group very closely related to the ethnic groups that would become the Mongols thousands of years down the line, but a group of nomads looking for game to hunt or what have you kept wandering into new territory until one day, all of a sudden, there's lots of game to hunt and all kinds of resources up for grabs, and so it seems like a good place to settle, and now you have a population of humans permanently settled in North America for the first time. Well, that's exactly what happened when the first humans came over from Essos. These early groups of humans were known as the First Men. And once they show up right away, it's... If there was a playbook that described terrible human behavior, well, the First Men follow it to a T. They discover this new land, and they take a look around and think, Hey, this is pretty nice, and and they decide to move in. And when the non-human races who already live there start poking around to see what's going on, 
the first men say, gee, you know, it is a really nice place and it was really hard to get here. So we're really very sorry. But, you know, if you make a fuss about this, we're just going to have to kill all of you. Now, again, this all happened thousands of years ago and there isn't a lot of written material to go off of. So it's unclear what happened next. But shortly after the first men show up, the giants start to slowly make their way off the world stage. Now, you'd think that if they wanted to, the Giants could have just fought the First Men and kicked their butts back to Essos, but that's not what happened. And even though there's no proof of this, I happen to think it's because they, the the Giants, knew that if push came to shove, they wouldn't be able to beat the First Men in a full-on conflict. Which is strange, because you'd think that they'd be great at fighting. And from what I've read, they were great at one-on-one combat, but everything past that, everything that goes into fighting a war, you know, planning, an organization, moving large groups of people, supply trains, none of that was really in the giant's wheelhouse. You want somebody to smash something, you call a giant. But if you want somebody to smash a lot of different things in specific places over a long period of time in a coordinated way, you call humans. That's just how it goes. So, my guess is that pretty early on, the Giants realize that they're outmanned, or out-first-manned, as it were, and they retreat north, where they, sadly for people like me, basically disappear from history. But the children of the forest are another issue entirely. I'm sure they weren't happy with the arrival of the First Men, but they seem to have tolerated them. And that all changes when the first men start building forts and buildings and things like that. Because in order to build forts, you're going to need two things. Space and something to build with. And from the human point of view, cutting down trees solves both of these problems. So they start going out and collecting lumber, which means they, without knowing what it is that they're doing, start cutting down heart trees. Which, to the children of the forest, well, I, well, think of it like this. If you're a Christian and somebody shows up one day and waltzes into your church and starts tearing down the crucifixes on your walls and using them to build a log cabin, well, you'd be pretty ticked off, wouldn't you? Up until they start cutting down heart trees, the children seem to tolerate the first men. But once that happens, they attack and boom, just like that, the first men and the children of the forest go to war. And just to be clear, you know, the the first men were not... Knights in shining armor who rode magnificently bred war horses into battle with ribbons tied around their lances or or anything like that. These were people whose most sophisticated technology was a bronze sword or a, a leathern shield. So the first men were not some sort of godlike force. This is not the conquistadors coming to South America. This isn't the Wehrmacht facing off against Geronimo or something like that. Because even though they're small... The children prove to be a tough enemy in battle. They're sort of like, uh, well, they're sort of like magical Viet Cong. You know, they're, they're fighting on their home turf. They're able to melt into the woods at a moment's notice. And on top of that, they've got the ability to cast spells. I'm going to pause for a minute here to talk about something, uh, well, a little unusual. You see, magic is a big part of this story, and that's tricky for people like myself who thrive on, you know, facts and first-person accounts. And, well, I'm a fan of hard evidence, is I guess what I'm trying to say. But the truth is, when it comes to magic, we don't have any idea how it works. All we know is that it used to be a major part of this world. And then for some reason, it faded away. It's a bit like how after the Roman Empire fell, the barbarians who lived in former Roman territory would see these, you know, these crumbling aqueducts and not have any idea what they were or what they did or even who or what built them in the first place. We know that the Romans built them to supply water to different parts of the empire. But if you were just roving through the forest looking for deer and you came across one that hadn't been used in a century, you could be forgiven if you thought it was something beyond human understanding. And I bring that up because, to me, the role that magic occupies in the history of Westeros is similar to those crumbling Roman aqueducts. There's evidence of magic having once been all over the place in Westeros, but for the most part, it's something that just hasn't been around for a long, long time. And everybody who understood it is long gone, and just how and why it worked is a complete mystery to the people who are still alive today. On top of that, The documentation of magic is spotty at best. 
So even if we read about a spell someone cast, there's no telling how much of what we're being told is embellishment or accurate or just flat out wrong. What I'm saying is, when we talk about spells in this story or prophecies or anything that's even remotely magical in nature, it's best to take it with a, well, with a giant-sized grain of salt. For instance, one of the first things that the children of the forest supposedly do in this war with the first men is cast a spell that destroys the land bridge that connected Westeros to Essos. The thinking being that if they destroyed the bridge, then no other humans would be able to make it to Westeros. Then they just kill all of the humans who are already there and forget the whole thing ever happened. So the children, supposedly, cast this spell of theirs, the ocean rises up, there's a series of tsunamis, and boom, no more land bridge. Just a bunch of little isolated islands called the Stepstones. Now, great example of what I was just talking about. Was it a spell? Maybe. To me, it seems like it could have just as easily, and maybe even more likely, been some kind of a geological event, like an earthquake or something. But even if all that happened was the children of the forest taking tactical advantage of a natural disaster, well, that's still pretty darned impressive, if you ask me. But there are some smaller, documented magical abilities that the children can and do use. They can talk to animals, they can see what's happening hundreds of miles away, which is handy when you're fighting a war, good for reconnaissance. And supposedly a few of them can even warg, which is their word for shape-shifting into animals and monsters and things of that nature. And it's worth taking a moment to try to really, well, to really put yourselves in the shoes of the first men who are going up against all this magic stuff. I mean, looking at it from our perspective, a handful of spells might not sound too impressive, especially when the other side is, you know, twice as tall with swords and bows and weaponry that we've all seen win wars over and over and over again throughout all of history. But when you start putting all of these magical abilities together, you get an enemy that is extremely difficult to fight. And remember, the humans fighting the children of the forest don't have magic of their own, and they don't really know how it works, and they certainly don't have a handy little list of spells that they can point to and say, yep, that's it, that's all the magic the enemy's got. They simply don't know, or even have any real way of guessing whether or not the magic they're seeing is the most powerful magic there is, or a mere parlor trick. I mean, imagine never having heard of a gun before, and an enemy sniper takes out a soldier in your camp who's standing right next to you. You wouldn't know that if you took cover, you could prevent that from happening again. And you wouldn't know that the sniper's got a limited supply of ammunition and eventually he'll run out. And you certainly wouldn't know whether or not that destructive capability is something that's limited to a few elite troops with extensive training, or if that's something even the freshest recruit can do right out of the gate. The effect magic must have had on the morale of the first men, it it must have just been absolutely devastating. And you can imagine that if their escape route across that land bridge hadn't already been completely destroyed by this very same mysterious magic stuff, well, they might have considered cutting their losses and heading back the way they came. Only that isn't an option anymore. The first men have no choice but to hunker down and fight. And that is exactly what they do. The war between the First Men and the Children of the Forest goes on for hundreds of years, and it's basically just a slog. No major battles that we know about, just a lot of skirmishes and attacks and things of that nature. Most scholars think that in spite of the magic, the First Men would have eventually won, but that doesn't change the fact that if you're fighting for hundreds of years, even if you're the stronger side, you're eventually going to start thinking to yourself, gosh, I sure could use a couple of years where I wasn't trying to build a farm, raise a family, and battle some magic-wielding elves. Which is why both sides eventually agree that the war is basically just an enormous waste of time and energy for everybody involved. Now, in the middle of Westeros, there's this big lake called the God's Eye. And in the center of the God's Eye, there's an island called the Isle of Faces. I believe because most of the trees there are heart trees. And this is where the children and the first men meet to see if they can hammer out some sort of lasting peace agreement. And they do! It's known as the Pact, and it basically says that the first men get all of the open spaces in Westeros, the children get all of the deep areas of the forests, and most importantly, both sides will stop killing each other. And then, as quickly as it started, the war is over, and the first men start spreading out across all of Westeros. They form hundreds of little kingdoms up and down the continent, and soon enough, Westeros has gone from having no human beings to being filled with them. 
It's an interesting time, and one that reminds me a lot of, um, you know, mythologized Viking history. There are battles and wars and quests and heroes and villains and monsters and all sorts of stuff. It's a time known as, and, and boy, I, I love this name. It's called the Age of Heroes. The Age of Heroes lasts for thousands of years, and a ton of important stuff happens in it. I mean, great houses that are still around today uh, can trace their lineage back to this era. The wall, an 800-foot-tall wall made out of magical ice, stretches across the entire continent, is built during this time. And as were a bunch of strongholds and forts and cities that are still around and still in use during the War of the Five Kings. There were knights and battles and epic wars and vanquished foes and great loves and evil villains, and it reminds me of the stories from King Arthur's court, honestly. But it should be noted that there's also a lot of mythology mixed in with the history from this era, and nobody's really sure about the finer points of who was king when or where, and when was so-and-so castle built, and all of that stuff. A lot of the details are hazy, but the main point is, the Age of Heroes was an extraordinarily, well, awesome period in the history of Westeros. But, like all ages must, it eventually comes to an end. Or rather, more of a screeching halt, when another batch of humans shows up from Essos. A group known as the Andals. The Andals are a nomadic people that come from a part of Essos known as Andalos. And they go to Westeros because they're fleeing something. And I promise you that we'll get to exactly what that something is later on. But for right now, all you need to know is that the Andals are sort of like the first men on steroids. They're big, they're fast, they're mean. They've mastered ironwork, which instantly puts them above the first men and their bronze weapons. They can build boats, which is how they got to Westeros. And which means if it was the children who destroyed the land bridge, well, they basically did it for nothing. And the Andals have a history filled with strife and warfare that has made them extremely good at killing people. And last but not least, they've got a religion called the Seven that tells them that what they're doing isn't just God's will, it's the will of seven gods. And this is a situation that you see all the time where history basically just flat out repeats itself. I mean, things on Westeros had been going pretty good. There was a truce between the first men and the children of the forest. Everyone had been enjoying that whole age of heroes thing. And then, basically overnight, a group of heavily armed human beings show up out of the blue and say exactly what the first men said thousands of years earlier. Hey, uh, this is really a nice place you got here, and you know, it sure was hard to get here, so we're really very sorry, but we're just going to have to kill all of you. And once again, just like that, the Andals go to war against the first men and the children of the forest. And you know, even though by this point the children and the first men are not only allies, but sort of friends. I bet that on some level, the children must have been thinking, you know, well, 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 now you guys know what it's like having some jerk show up and take over your home. Not so fun, is it? Unfortunately, though, the children are the first and probably biggest losers in this war. You know, when the first men for, uh, first showed up, the children were kind of in prime fighting shape, but... Ever since the pact, their numbers have been shrinking, they don't really leave the forests, and they haven't been fighting with anyone for thousands of years. They're sort of like a prize fighter who was great when he was younger, and then gets back into the ring when he's 50 and realizes that he's just not the force he used to be. The children of the forest have gotten soft. And on top of that, you know, even though the first men went to war with the children, they were at least interested in them. In fact, After the pact, the first men adopted a whole bunch of the children's customs, including their religion. There was a lot of uh, cultural osmosis, I guess you could call it. But the Andals aren't interested in the children at all. In fact, their equivalent of the Bible, a a book called The Seven-Pointed Star, is pretty clear that creatures like the children are abominations, and they should be wiped out. Sadly, we've seen this phenomenon time and time again throughout history, and it still happens sometimes even today. This is ethnic cleansing, and the Andals are going to prove to be very, very good at it. The Andals start wiping the children of the forest off the face of the Westerosi earth. They kill them on sight, they destroy their sacred trees, and just generally act like you'd expect an invading force that's convinced God, or in this case, seven gods, are on their side to act. And at first the children fight back, but you can tell that their heart isn't really in it. 
This is the second war they've had to fight against humanity, and at this point, you gotta imagine they're thinking that even if they win, it's probably just a matter of time until another, better-armed group of humans shows up on their doorstep and they have to do this all over again. So they do exactly what the giants did a few thousand years before. They look around, say, hey, thanks, this has been a lot of fun, and then they retreat north to the land of always winter and disappear from history. Now, the first men can't do that. They're not magical creatures. They don't know how to survive in the north. All they can do is fight. The one thing they've got on their side is numbers. There are a lot more of them than there are of the Andals. They know the area better than the Andals do, and, after all, this is the Age of Heroes, and so there's all these legendary, you know, kind of, again, Arthurian figures running around that can always be pretty handy in a fight. But, you know... As is the case throughout history, those things don't always matter so much when the other side has a significant technological advantage with the kind of weaponry they're bringing to the table. Here's how Meister Garcia Jr. describes that advantage. Oh, and the vale he'll refer to in this quote is the valley that the Andals originally land in. It's their Plymouth Rock, as it were. Anyway, quote, Sweeping through the Vale with fire and sword, the Andals began their conquest of Westeros. Their iron weapons and armor surpassed the bronze with which the first men still fought, and many first men perished in this war. End quote. And what happens is, well, basically what happened between the first men and the children of the forest. There's a long series of smaller battles that drag on for decades, and while the Andals would probably have eventually won, it would have taken them forever, and so they start making deals with the first men. Treaties are signed, marriages are made, alliances formed, and pretty soon the two sides aren't at war anymore. In fact, they start merging together. People are people, so, you know, once the fighting stops, Andals start having children with the first men and vice versa. And in a few generations, basically all of Westeros is a mix of the two cultures, except for the north half of the continent, which retains a lot of the older customs from the days of the Pact. And that's why, if you're, say, vacationing in the north, you'll notice that a lot of their customs are different from the rest of Westeros. Other than that, you can see the intermixing of the two cultures even today. The Seven, which is the dominant religion of Westeros, comes straight from the Andals. Meanwhile, every major castle in the country has something called a God's Grove, which is where heart trees are allowed to grow. And that's from the first men, who obviously got the idea from the children. And it's after this assimilation that you can see what we know as modern Westeros start to take shape. The hundreds of little kingdoms, that was a first man thing. Once the Andals show up and start fighting everybody and conquering everything, that number drops way, way down. And after a while, the country's gone from having hundreds of kingdoms to just having seven of them. And maybe that's why the history of Westeros gets a lot clearer during and after this period. There's just way less to keep track of. Or, that's my theory anyway, but as I've said before, I'm not a historian. Simply a fan of history. Now, these seven kingdoms will come up a lot in this story, so I'm going to run down each one of them, starting at the north of Westeros and working our way downwards. First off, there's the Kingdom of the North, which is just a huge piece of land, almost as big as the rest of Westeros combined. But not many people live here, though. It's, it's a bit like Canada in that way. Then there's the Kingdom of the Isles and Rivers, or the Riverlands, and that stretches from this narrow area of the continent called the Neck down to around the middle of Westeros. To the east of the Riverlands is where the Andals originally landed, the Vale, and that's called the Kingdom of Mountain and Vale. Then, to the west of the Riverlands is the Kingdom of the Rock, which is sometimes called the Westerlands, and down below that, to the southeast, you've got the Kingdom of the Stormlands, and to the southwest of the, is the Kingdom of the Reach. And finally, at the very south of Westeros, you've got a kingdom that's simply called Dorne. Now, the borders between these kingdoms vary from time to time, and the alliances between kingdoms shift back and forth, but for the most part, these seven kingdoms are pretty stable. Certainly more so than any other set of political groups we've seen in Westeros up to this point. And here's what I find really, really just mind-boggling about the seven kingdoms and why they're so important to this story. The families that ruled those seven kingdoms are for the most part the same families that are involved in the War of the Five Kings thousands of years later. I mean, that's, that's just crazy, folks. Try, try to really wrap your head around that. If you wind the clock back 3,000 years today, I mean, 
with the exception of maybe some of the ancient Israelites, you'd have to be an expert to recognize any of the prominent family names from back then. I mean, it's not like 3,000 years ago, House Obama was ruling over North America. Yet, during the War of the Five Kings, we're dealing with families and political factions who can trace their history back at least that far, and in some cases, even farther. And as we'll see, although that incredibly long ancestral memory makes things much, much more complicated for somebody looking at things from our perspective, it has the counterintuitive effect of making things very black and white for some of the people involved in this conflict. Because even though today, the borders of the Seven Kingdoms are more or less the same as they used to be, and the families running them are more or less the same as they used to be, there's one major difference between the Seven Kingdoms of today and the Seven Kingdoms of 3,000 or 1,000 or heck, even 500 years ago. And it's that up until very recently, the Seven Kingdoms did not consider themselves part of a larger country. They were independent, sovereign nations with different laws and rulers and geography, and and none of them had any allegiance to one another. And to hammer that home, these seven kingdoms were basically in a perpetual state of war with one another. Now, when I say war, what I mean is there would be territorial disputes and land grabs and things of that nature, but, you know, it wasn't like the time of the first men when kingdoms would come and go. The Seven Kingdoms were all pretty powerful, so even if one of them lost a war, the worst that would happen is they'd lose some of their land, or a king would have to marry their daughter to someone he didn't like, or something like that. By and large, it's not like any of the kingdoms just disappeared. And then, all of that changes. And it changes because of one guy, just one man, who showed up and did what nobody else had been able to do in 8,000 years which was to conquer all of Westeros and bring it under the rule of one undisputed king. That man's name was Aegon Targaryen, otherwise known as Aegon the Conqueror. And this brings us to the second part of today's story, which focuses on where Aegon came from. Because you see, before he was a conqueror, Aegon was a refugee. In fact, Aegon's entire family, the Targaryens, they were all refugees. They fled from that continent I've been talking about a lot today, Essos. Now, the Targaryens are an absolutely just fascinating family, but in order to understand what made them so fascinating, we need to know a little bit more about where they were from and why they were fleeing, and so we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the history of Essos. I'll do my best to keep it brief, but, you know, this is me we're talking about here, so you might as well take a moment to get comfortable before we dive in. Now, remember earlier when I said Essos was roughly the size and shape of Asia? Well, if you can picture Asia in your mind, or maybe Eurasia would be a better approximation, right around where Moscow would be is where the first world-class empire in the Westerosi world appears. It's called, and I am certain that I'm mispronouncing this, apologies in advance, it's called the Gikari Empire, or sometimes the Old Empire of Geese, in recognition of the city where it all started, Old Geese. Now, Old Geese was founded by a guy who called himself Grozdan the Great, And Grozdan's big claim to fame is that he was, according to our sources, the first guy who figured out how to create a somewhat modern army. Not modern in the way we think of today. It's not like Grozdan's outfitting his troops with stall helms before loading them onto an aircraft carrier. But still, very modern in the sense that this is a professional army made of soldiers, and not just thousands of farmers swinging clubs around for a bit between harvests. So, when we're talking about Grozdan the Great's armies, we're talking about something like an army you might have found in ancient Rome. Disciplined, trained fighters taking orders from superiors working together to achieve long-term strategic goals. To say that this was an improvement over what armies were like at the time would be an understatement, to say the least. Grozdan was able to train troops so that they, well, not only acted like they were part of a larger whole, but they did what they were told, and they did it well. This might not seem like that big of a deal, but discipline is huge in warfare, folks. And when you have an army that's operating like one giant fighting force going up against undisciplined enemies that all have a thousand different ideas about how to fight and where to fight and where to retreat and all of that, it's not a contest. It's a slaughter. I mean, 
Grostan's armies were so effective that thousands of years later, the slave armies of Essos, known as the Unsullied, still use his tactics, and they're widely considered the finest armies on either continent. This new, modern army was a ruthlessly efficient killing machine. And in the hands of Grazdan the Great, it was also a tool. A tool used to build an empire. You know the old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day? Well, you could also say the Gikari Empire wasn't built in a day, even when you've got the best army that's ever taken the field. The first thing Grazdan does is to found geese. And then he immediately takes his legions and goes out and starts expanding his territory. And right away, it's clear that his army is light years better than anything else out there. It must have been a lot like the Romans trouncing the Gauls time and time and time again. So after a while, grozdan has gone from having one city that he founded to having quite a few that he conquered. And then all of a sudden he's got an empire. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really like Gikari culture. And you know me, I tend to avoid sweeping generalizations like that. I'm not trying to offend anybody out there who may be of Gikari descent, but in this case, I think it's warranted. And, and it's not that their language sounds like somebody trying to swallow a mouthful of bees or that their god is this truly disgusting-looking harpy, I mean, or that they would throw up everywhere they went. That sort of stuff I can get past. But what I can't get past is that from its very beginning, the Gikari Empire celebrated slavery. It wasn't just a part of their culture. It was, aside from their armies, the bedrock of their culture. Now, they weren't the only people to practice slavery. Lots of groups throughout history have dabbled in it. But the Gikari are the only ones I can think of who put slavery on the kind of pedestal that they did, and I just can't get past that. And you all know my thoughts on slavery. I think it's a despicable practice. Utterly inhuman and totally evil. As far as I'm concerned, as soon as you start using slavery for any reason, you're immediately invalidated as being worthy of having power on a global scale. One of its more despicable qualities is that once slavery becomes a cornerstone of your country's foundation, the next step is for it to become part of your country's economy. And once that happens, it's like bone cancer. It's just incredibly hard to get rid of without destroying everything it touches. I mean, even during the War of the Five Kings, which is thousands of years later, there are still three major cities that the Gikari founded that are 100% economically reliant on selling human beings into slavery. Thousands of years later. Slavery is a disease that's very, very difficult to cure. And unfortunately, it's a disease that is very good for some parts of its host. I mean, if you had bone cancer, and instead of killing you, it made you stronger, you probably wouldn't be in a rush to go see your doctor. The Gikari, with the help of this slave trade that they not only set up, but invented, were able to grow even stronger than they already were. And pretty soon, they were the most powerful force in Essos by a long shot. And they stayed that way for thousands of years. Until... Well, if you could have zoomed out of the Gikari Empire on a map and then flown west a few hundred miles and zoomed back in, you'd arrive at a peninsula that was interesting for two reasons. The first was that it had some of the best farmland in the world. And part of the reason it had such great farmland is that this peninsula was ringed by 14 massive volcanoes called the 14 Flames. At the base of these volcanoes lived a group of people known as the Valyrians. A group of people that were shepherds, not exactly the kind of folk you'd expect to take down an empire of slavers with the most powerful army on the continent, is it? The Valyrians herded sheep, they set up farms, and that was about it. The only really interesting thing about them was that physically, they looked different from just about everyone else. They tended to have this bright silver hair and violet eyes, but other than that, they were actually sort of boring. It's not even like the way they herded sheep was particularly revolutionary or interesting. I mean, if you had a contest to pick the people least likely to shake up Essos, the Valerians would win hands down. But even though the Valerians themselves might not be all that interesting at this point, the place they live sure as heck is. I'm not a geologist, but I'm pretty sure that having 14 volcanoes all crowded around one peninsula is a pretty rare setup. And these boring ancient Valerians are just sitting smack dab in the middle of it all herding sheep. 
Until one day, as the story goes, a group of Valyrians goes poking around in the tunnels that sort of spiderweb through those 14 volcanoes, and they discover something that will change the course of the entire world. Dragons. I'm talking about real dragons, folks. Giant, fire-breathing lizards that can fly. And this isn't hearsay or speculation or anything like that. Dragons existed, and there's a ton of evidence to back it up. It's not like we heard a few reports from Astapor that a dragon might have been at such and such battle, or a Meister found a mention of one in some old scroll nobody remembers. People saw them. Heck, some people rode them. And lots and lots of people were killed by them. Dragons were very, very real. What's unclear is what was humanity's relationship to dragons before the Valyrians discovered where they lived. Did they used to leave the volcanoes for food? Were they just sort of accepted as a force of nature, you know, terrifying, but something you just had to deal with? Or were they hibernating, waiting for someone to find them and wake them up? I haven't been able to find any documentation about it, but if you know of any, shoot me an email. Now, despite being pretty humble, the Valyrians seem to have had some sort of intrinsic magical ability. When it comes to sorcery and spells and all of that, they were just naturals at it, and nobody knows why either. It's a mystery that still exists even today. It's sort of like, well, take Kenyans, for example. All of the fastest runners come from Kenya, and there's a fair amount of studies that seem to think that the altitude of Kenya as a country forces the human body to develop an unusually large amount of slow-twitch muscles. Slow-twitch muscles are what people use when they're running long distances. My personal theory about the Valerians is along those lines. I think there must have been something about the location that locked in this magical talent biologically. I mean, I didn't grow up in the shadow of 14 volcanoes, but if I had, then maybe I'd be a little more magical in nature. You know, maybe if I lived near Mount St. Helens or Krakatoa or Mount Vesuvius, I'd be able to... Well, I still wouldn't be as magical as a Valyrian, but at least I'd have a shot. But again, you know, that's just speculation. At the end of the day, nobody knows why the Valyrians were so talented when it comes to magic. Which makes this part of the story frustrating, because again, we don't know how they do it. But somehow this group of sheep herders manages to bring the dragons under their direct control. To the point that they could not only ride them, but tell them where to go, and more importantly, who to attack. And almost overnight, certainly in historical terms, the Valyrians go from herding sheep to founding an empire. They abandon the sheep, build a capital city near those 14 volcanoes, call Valyria, and then they go out and kill everyone, starting with the Gikari. Now, up until this point, the Gikari had ignored the Valyrians, if they even knew they existed at all. Remember, the pre-dragon Valyrians were pretty easy to ignore. But as soon as the Valyrians get dragons, they're instantly a world-class superpower. And they're right next door to the Gikari. So, of course, they're going to come to blows. Now, normally the Gikari would wipe the floor with the Valyrians. They've been around a lot longer, they've got the best trained army in the world, and very few shepherds would be able to kill one Gikari soldier, let alone thousands. But, as the Gikari quickly learned, the strength of your army doesn't matter at all when the other side has dragons. Because, folks, dragons are basically living, breathing atomic bombs that eat sheep, breathe fire, and can be used over and over and over and over and over again. They're an absolutely unstoppable weapon, and the Valyrians were the only ones who had them. It reminds me a lot of America just after World War II when we were the only ones who had the bomb. I mean, just the threat of another Hiroshima or Nagasaki was enough to keep a tense kind of peace for a little while. Imagine if we were the only ones who had the bomb and the only people on the planet who had an air force. I mean, if you were a country who didn't like what we were doing, there wouldn't have been much you could do about it. Of course, atomic bombs were incredibly complex machines that took a long time to make, and you could only use each one once, and so the sheer difficulty and cost of making one ensured that they couldn't just be detonated willy-nilly, and I think that we're all pretty thankful for that. But in the case of the Valyrians... They've got tons of dragons. It doesn't cost anything to produce them, and they, the Valyrians, are operating in a time period where there isn't really any reason to stop conquering other people. It's just what you do. 
1946, if America had decided to drop atomic bombs on other countries, there would have been a huge amount of pushback from the international community, and there would have been maybe even more pushback coming from American groups. That mentality simply does not exist when the Valyrians discover dragons. Other countries certainly aren't happy about what they're doing, but nobody is objecting on moral grounds either. Conquering is just the name of the game. So there's a series of five wars between the Gikari and the Valyrians called the Gikari Wars, and the Valyrians win all of them. And I think, I think the reason that there were that many wars at all, instead of, say, one, is because at this point, the Valyrians are still getting their sea legs in terms of how to fight wars with dragons. Their dragon legs, I guess you could say. Because, again, nobody's ever used dragons before. This is an entirely new kind of warfare that the Valyrians are basically making up as they go along. And if the Valyrian army of the 5th Gikari War had met the Gikari army from the 1st Gikari War, well, I guess the outcome would have ultimately been the same, but the Valyrians would have just gotten there a lot faster. After the Valyrians win the 5th Gikari War, they, well, they introduce themselves to the world. You know how in Victorian England, or, or sometimes the southern United States, a lot of times when a girl turns 15 or 16, her parents will have a debutante ball so that their daughter can be properly introduced to society? Well, after the Fifth War, the Valerians have their debutante ball. They fly to Geese, the seat of the Gikari Empire's power, and they burn it to the ground. And I don't mean they set it on fire. I mean they turn every single building into a pile of ash then salt the earth so that nothing can grow there again. And you know, the term scorched earth gets thrown around a lot in military history, but in this case, it's not hyperbole. It's a literal description of how the earth looked after the Valyrians were finished. That's how the Valyrians announced their arrival as a new player on the global stage. And they made certain that everybody heard them loud and clear. If a dragon comes knocking at your door and you don't open it, that dragon will burn your entire city to the ground. After they've wiped out the Gikari, the Valyrians start building, well, they call it a freehold for some governmental reasons, but it's basically just an empire. And it reminds me a lot of the Roman Empire, because with Valyria, they've got this capital city with beautiful architecture and culture and art, and everything's great. And from there, they branch out and build other cities and conquer other nations. And they connect all of them with these amazing roads that they build using magic that are essentially indestructible. And slowly but surely, they bring most of Essos under their control. Although, they would probably say that they civilized all of Essos, and there's some truth in that terminology as well. Of course, there's a dark side to all that civilization. First off, they had to kill a whole bunch of people to get it. But also, there's a lot of work that goes into building, let alone maintaining an empire. And not only is there a lot of work, but it's expensive. How are you going to pay for all this expansion you're doing? Well, when the Valyrians went snooping around the volcanoes, they discovered that those volcanoes were riddled with gold deposits, which some meisters say is the reason the dragons were living there to begin with. And not to get ahead of myself here, but there's a wonderful kind of irony to the way in which the rise of the Valyrian freehold would have been impossible without the very same system of volcanoes that eventually led to its downfall. Now, it should go without saying that mining inside active volcanoes is incredibly dangerous. It's the sort of work that no self-respecting Valyrian citizen would do. Still, there's wars to fight and an empire to build and all sorts of expensive stuff, so one way or another, the Valyrians had to get that gold. And they got it by using the one piece of Gikari culture that they actually adopted after the wars. They do it with slaves. Thousands of them. Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. I mean, there was an unspeakable level of suffering that took place to keep that empire going. And it was suffering that lasted for generations. Want to get all the gold out of that volcano? Well, just send wave after wave of slaves down there for a few hundred years and you'll have your gold. And the Valyrians didn't just use slaves to mine. Their entire empire was built both literally and figuratively with slaves. Remember what I was saying about slavery being a cancer? Well, when the Valyrians interacted with the Gikari, they got infected with it. And they expanded the slave trade in ways the Gikari never could. The scope of the Valyrian freehold was so much larger than that of the Gikari Empire that it represented an exponential rise in the enslaved portion of the population. The amount of human suffering must have been absolutely staggering. But if you weren't a slave, 
you'd probably really enjoy being a part of the freehold. Lots of trade, lots of money, a stable government, secure borders, what's not to like? Meanwhile, if you didn't live in the Valyrian freehold, then the Valyrian freehold must have been pretty terrifying. Whatever Valyria wanted, Valyria got. Because nobody wanted to make a fuss, have their cities be burnt to ash, and then spend the rest of their lives building new cities for the people who burnt down theirs. Again, it was a pretty cushy deal for the Valyrians, but mostly because everybody else was getting the short end of the stick. Now, for a few thousand years, the Valyrians let their western border be defined by this thousand-mile-long river that bisected Essos. It's called the Rhoyne and all the hundreds of little towns that stretched up and down the river formed a loose coalition known as the Roynish Empire. And for a few thousand years, the two empires had a sort of uneasy peace going. You stay on your side of the river, and I'll stay on mine, and we'll leave it at that. But then, after a few thousand years have gone by, the Valyrians start looking past the Rhoyne and saying, uh, Hey, what's over there? Can we conquer any of it? We sure could go for some more land and more slaves. Well... One of the things that was to the west of the Rhoyne was a group of people you're familiar with called the Andals. And when the Valyrians start poking around, the Andals read the writing on the wall, say, we'll take our chances as refugees in Westeros rather than as slaves in Essos, and the entire culture picks up and heads out, proceeding to give the first men a taste of their own medicine. After the Andals leave, the truce between the Rhoynish Empire and the Valyrians holds a little bit longer, but eventually it breaks down and the two powers go to war. And it must have been an interesting war to see because while the Valyrians were skilled with magic on land, sometimes called geomancy, the Rhoynish were apparently skilled with magic that involved water, aquamancy. And remember, the Valyrians were shepherds originally, very much tied to the land, and the Rhoynish are so at one with this Amazon-sized river that they share the same name. And the Rhoynish aquamancers are said to have spells that turned any body of water into a devastating weapon of mass destruction. So... There are stories of tidal waves aimed at Valyrian armies, giant water spouts fired up into the sky taking down dragons, and all sorts of absolutely fascinating magic. Of course, for the people who lived through it, it must have been absolutely terrifying, and I'm not trying to downplay the severity of their experience. I mean, if you were riding a dragon and thought you were invincible, and then all of a sudden a geyser of magic water punches you out of the sky, you probably weren't thinking about the finer points of the spell that just hit you at all. But from a historical perspective, this is really fascinating stuff. But at the end of the day, the Valyrians won because, again, folks, you just cannot beat dragons in war. The amount of damage dragons can do is absolutely unmatched by any other kind of weapons technology or magical offensive capability at this time. And even though the Rhoynish put up a better fight than most, you just cannot beat an army with dragons. Could our modern air force? Maybe. It would be an interesting matchup, that's guaranteed. I've seen some figures saying that the destructive power of a single dragon is roughly equal to 10 of the bombs we dropped on Hiroshima, and I've seen other figures pointing out that dragon fire would have been closer to a supercharged flamethrower, but nobody really knows, and even our best guesses are suspect because we don't really understand how magic played into the whole thing. Either way, barring a modern air force, you can't beat dragons. So the Rhoynish Empire collapses... 10,000 of their escape ships head to Dorne, and the Valyrians suddenly become the only superpower in all of Essos. Now, the government of Valyria was a funny thing. Uh, In theory, any freeborn citizen of the empire who owned land got a vote in what happened. But in reality, the whole empire was controlled by about 40 families, you know, give or take a family or two. And what made these families a big deal was that their members were the ones who could control the dragons. Now, again, nobody is exactly sure how you control a dragon. You know, the best that our sources can tell us is that since the ability to control dragons appears to have followed bloodlines, the documentation on bloodlines from ancient Valyria is as good as it can possibly be, it seemed to be a mixture of some sort of innate genetic uh, dragon ability, possibly combined with magic. But whatever it was, it seems to have been a skill set that was rare even among the Valyrians. And it was a skill set that these 40 families had and were able to pass down to their descendants. These families were called dragon lords. Now, you can talk about freemen and votes and open government all you want, but if one family has dragons and the other doesn't, well, you can guess whose vote matters more. The bottom line is that from the very beginning of the Valyrian Empire, the dragon lords ran the show. 
And one of these Dragonlord families had a surname that you'll hopefully remember. Targaryen. They're arguably the most important refugees to ever set foot on Westeros. And the Targaryens weren't the most powerful of the Dragonlord families. In fact, they seem to have been on the weaker side. But, you know, they had dragons, so weak is a relative word here. Even the weakest of the Dragonlord families is still stronger than most nation-states on the face of the planet at this point in history, and stronger even than any of the kingdoms involved in the War of the Five Kings. It's just that they're playing in a higher league. And the way that the Targaryens go from helping run an empire to becoming refugees begins with a dream. And by the time this dream happens, Valyria has been the cultural top dog of Essos for thousands of years. The empire's never been better. Things are going great. And then, one of the Targaryens, a girl by the name of Dianus, has a dream. Although nightmare is probably the better word for it. Because Dianus dreams that at some point in the near future, all of Valyria, mighty, unbeatable, dragon-protected Valyria, is going to be destroyed. She doesn't know how. She doesn't know when. Just that it's going to be soon, and that the devastation will be total. When she wakes up, she goes and tells her father, the head of the Targaryen family, a a man by the name of Aenar, about this crazy dream she had, and he believes her. Which isn't too strange, because Dianus apparently had a history of dreaming things that eventually ended up coming true. And again, this is a culture that not only believes in magic, but in a lot of ways is built on it. So, whereas if your daughter had a bad dream, you might just get her a glass of water and let her sleep in your room for the rest of the night. When Anar's daughter has a bad dream, he asks her about it. And he listens like his life depends on it, because it very well just might. So Anar hears this dream and realizes that he's got to let some people know about this completely unknown but 100% deadly, you know, impending cataclysm. And he does exactly that. He goes before all the other dragon lords and says, here's the deal. We've got a plan for this. We've got to make sure we're ready. All of us are in a lot of danger. And they basically laugh him out of the room. It reminds me a little bit of Kael, you know, Superman's dad, going to the other powerful Kryptonians and saying, the world is ending, the world is ending, and nobody believes him, so he takes matter into his own hands and sends his only son away to safety. Aenar Targaryen has a similar reaction. Only, he doesn't just send one of his kids away, he moves his whole family out of Valyria. Relatives, slaves, furniture, gold, dragons, obviously dragons. Aenar packs up everything, and he moves as far away as he can go without leaving the Valyrian Empire. Which is how the Targaryens ended up on an island called Dragonstone. And for Valyrians, Dragonstone is basically Siberia. It's thousands of miles west from the Valyrian capital. It's isolated in the middle of an ocean. It doesn't have any cities, really. Just one giant stone fortress that the Valyrians built as an outpost. And that's it. There's nothing going on there. In fact, the only interesting thing about Dragonstone is that it's a couple of hundred miles off the coast of Westeros. Geographically speaking, it's right next door. So, Aenar moves his whole family out to Dragonstone... Everyone gets settled, they unpack, the dragons start eating a lot more fish, and then nothing happens. For years. Valyria keeps humming along, nothing is destroyed, and it seems like Aenar might just have made a pretty embarrassing mistake. You gotta imagine that after a while, no matter how much he trusted his daughter's talent, that he was probably started asking her stuff like, Gee, sweetie, have you had that dream again? I just want to make sure I didn't move our entire family to a rock in the middle of the ocean for nothing. But Diana says her dream will come true in time. And she's right. It takes a while, but her dream eventually comes true in spectacular fashion. Twelve years after the Targaryens land on Dragonstone, the Valyrian freehold is destroyed by an event known only as the Doom. And details about the Doom are scarce, because anyone who was in a position to see what happened was killed. But this is what we do know. On a perfectly nondescript morning, those 14 volcanoes I told you about earlier, you know, the ones where Valyrians discovered dragons and had slaves mine the gold used to build their empire, those 14 volcanoes erupt all at once, with no warning. This mass eruption triggers some sort of geological chain reaction, and every hill or mountain in Valyria explodes, all at the same time. 
You know, one of the best known volcanic eruptions I can think of is the uh, 1883 eruption of Krakatoa, which was a volcano in the Dutch East Indies. And when Krakatoa erupted, the sky turned red. In fact, it was so red that locals called the fire department to put out the fires as far away as New York City. I mean, the explosion was so loud that it reverberated around Earth for nearly a week afterwards, and the volcano threw so much soot and dust into the air that enough sunlight was reflected back into space to cool the entire planet by over 2 degrees Fahrenheit for the next five years. And Krakatoa was one volcano. The doom was 14. To say that the doom was catastrophic would be the understatement of a lifetime. The suffering caused by the doom must have been absolutely unfathomable. And it's not just humans who suffer because of this. The dragons are wiped out. Dragons came from those volcanoes, remember? And just because the Valyrian Freehold had been growing its population didn't mean that the dragons had, too. I mean, throughout Valyrian history, the dragons stayed close to those volcanoes. So any dragons that were sleeping in them when the doom comes, they're killed immediately. Wiped out. And any dragon that was in flight nearby? Well, the eruptions from the volcanoes, which, remember, now stretch across the entire country, catch them in the air and burn them to death. And it doesn't stop there. After the volcanoes explode, a series of massive earthquakes kick off, which level anything left standing. And then, to top it off, the earthquakes trigger a series of tsunamis that come roaring over the country and turn the whole mess into an ocean. This isn't one natural disaster, folks. It's a series of natural disasters, any one of which would cripple any empire in history. And during the doom, Valyria gets them all at once. All of this devastation builds and builds until finally the peninsula where the Valyrians used to herd sheep, where they built the seat of their empire, is just torn off the mainland of Essos and shattered into hundreds of jagged little islands. Meister Garcia describes the devastation in his book, The World of Ice and Fire, thusly. Quote, The one thing that can be said for certain is that it was a cataclysm such as the world had never seen. The ancient and mighty freehold, home to dragons and to sorcerers of unrivaled skill, was shattered and destroyed within hours. It was written that every hill for 500 miles split asunder to fill the air with ash and smoke and fire so hot and hungry that even the dragons in the sky were engulfed and consumed. Great rents opened in the earth, swallowing palaces, temples, and entire towns. Lakes boiled or turned to acid. Mountains burst. Fiery fountains spewed molten rock a thousand feet into the air, and red clouds rained down dragon glass and the black blood of demons. To the north, the ground splintered and collapsed and fell in on itself as the angry sea came boiling in. The proudest city in all the world was gone in an instant. The fabled empire vanished in a day. End quote. Think about that. In one day, an entire species, dragons, are wiped out. The biggest city in the world is destroyed, and all of the Dragonlord families are annihilated. Except one. Far away on Dragonstone are the Targaryens. And, thanks to a dream, not only are the Targaryens alive, but they're the last of the Dragon Lords. Which means they're the only people on the entire planet who have dragons. Which makes them unique, obviously. It's a lot of power for one family to hold, right? If you suddenly were the only person in the whole world who had atomic bombs, what would you do? Well, I can tell you what Aenar Targaryen does. Nothing. He and his family stay on Dragonstone and, you know, basically just have to watch as Essos tears itself apart. Obviously. I mean, Valyria, which had been the big dog in town for thousands of years, is gone overnight. That's a massive power vacuum, folks. And the results are devastating. Wars break out all over the continent and go on for decades. It's a time known as the Century of Blood. And during this century, the Targaryens sit on Dragonstone and watch this unfold and just kind of keep to themselves. Now, earlier I mentioned that the interesting thing about Dragonstone was how close it was to Westeros. And the reason that's interesting, to me at least, is because it suggests that the Valyrians had to know that the Seven Kingdoms existed. And yet, they never bothered them. 
This was an empire that loved nothing more than conquering other nations, and when they discovered a whole continent that was rich with fertile land and mines and millions of potential slaves, they left it alone. They never bothered it. And the obvious question is why? I mean, Westeros is right there. And if you're an empire that's got an inexhaustible need for raw materials and slaves and all the other sorts of goodies you get when you're a conquering force, which the Valyrians most certainly were, Westeros must have looked like a steak on a silver platter. There are a few ideas on the matter. Some people think that they were worried about overextending their reach, or maybe they decided that it was more trouble than it was worth, that sort of stuff. My own pet theory is that it had something to do with magic. Specifically, I think it had something to do with that wall that's at the top of Westeros and whatever it's keeping out. I think the Valyrians knew what was on the other side of that wall, and they simply wanted no part of it. But again, that's just a theory of mine. There's really no way to know. Whatever the case may be, for the entire course of Valyrian history, they left Westeros alone. And the Targaryens keep that tradition alive for generations. They sit on Dragonstone, they collect taxes from passing ships, occasionally they get involved in minor political issues in Essos, but by and large they keep to themselves. That is until Aenar's great-great-great-grandson shows up and decides that it's time for the Targaryens to spread their wings a bit. And his grandson is one of the most famous figures in all of Westerosi history, on a level with somebody like Hitler or Genghis Khan or Alexander the Great. As you probably guessed, I'm talking about Aegon Targaryen, also known as Aegon the Conqueror. That's a great name, Aegon the Conqueror. And it suits the man, too. In paintings, he's depicted as a muscular, well-groomed, broad-shouldered type. And of course, he's got those violet eyes and platinum hair that all Targaryens have. He's said to have been charismatic and a great warrior, so you get the sense that even if he didn't have a dragon, he might be the kind of guy who people listen to regardless. But really, when you read the histories on him, for all the information the sources do have about him, you still get an overwhelming sense that there's an awful lot that we just don't know. I mean, we know who he was and what he did, but when you start looking around for the why that might explain some of his actions a little bit, you kind of have to come up with your own answers. Because Aegon the Conqueror, well, he's a bit of an enigma. It's not like Aegon was groomed to be a conqueror either. We can't look back at his father and his father's father and say, oh, yep, there it is, they started conquering three generations ago and just kept going. Between Aenar and Aegon, there were five generations of Targaryens who lived and died on Dragonstone with exactly the same resources that Aegon had, who never expressed any interest in Westeros. In fact, the Targaryens seemed to be way more interested in what was going on over in Essos. After all, that was the ancestral home, not only of their family, but of their former empire. And they're all that's left. You could forgive them for taking a few generations to recuperate before getting back into imperialism. But from an early age, Aegon was different. Westeros seems to have been on his mind since, well, forever. To give you an example of what I'm talking about here, when he was just a kid, Aegon commissioned this huge table to be built in the shape of Westeros. And I don't mean huge like, have the family over for Thanksgiving huge. I mean huge. 50 feet long, 25 feet wide at its widest point. It's absolutely massive. And Aegon had the top carved and painted to look like a map of Westeros, too. Rivers, mountains, cities, the whole thing. In fact, it's so well-constructed and so detailed that Stannis Baratheon will use it during the War of the Five Kings to plan the Battle of the Blackwater. This table will be an instrument of war for several hundred years, and it's Aegon's plaything. And tellingly, the one thing this giant painted table map doesn't have is borders. When you look down at it, there's no separation between the seven kingdoms. It all appears as one uninterrupted land. Now, looking back from our perspective, that makes a lot of sense. Westeros had hundreds of kingdoms, then seven, then one. For us, it seems like it was bound to happen eventually. But at the time, one kingdom to rule all of Westeros was a pretty radical concept. I mean, if somebody ran for president tomorrow and got on CNN and said, "Uh, from now on, there's no states. We tried it out, but it's just much easier to do away with all those borders, so no more states from here on out. People would flip out. 
And Aegon, as a child of a family that hasn't ever been the conquering type, is thinking about how to make Westeros into one big kingdom for most of his adolescence. So we know that while he was growing up, Aegon had Westeros on the brain. But that's not enough to explain why he launched his invasion. There's a lot of historians who really like Aegon. They think he was fundamentally a good guy. And Conqueror is just a flashy name with a bad connotation. Those people think he was trying to unite the Seven Kingdoms and put an end to the constant warfare between them. Other people look at Aegon and say, well, here's this guy with a dragon who did cause a lot of death and destruction, and if he was really that nice of a guy, why didn't he just sit at home on Dragonstone like his ancestors did? He must have been a typical megalomaniac, just like we've seen so frequently throughout history. The most likely scenario is that the truth lies somewhere in the middle, but the point is that we just don't know for sure. But this is what we do know. It's not exactly a smoking gun by any means, but there's one theory that Aegon invaded Westeros because he was insulted by a Westerosi lord. And if that is the case, then this is the story of the worst insult in the history of Westeros. So, off the west coast of Westeros is a group of islands called the Iron Islands. Traditionally, they're part of the Kingdom of the North, but throughout Westerosi history, they'd occasionally function as an autonomous power almost like an Eighth Kingdom that the Seven Kingdoms agree to tolerate every now and then until it gets unruly and has to be absorbed back into the Kingdom of the North. The Iron Islands are a naval power. Their ships and their sailors are, well, if not the best in the world, then certainly they're near the top of the list. And they've never been afraid of throwing that power around. I mean, throughout their entire history, the Ironborn, which is what they call themselves, have been notorious, uh, well, pirates is the wrong word, but it's pretty close. Really, they're more like Vikings. I mean, there are thousands of stories of the Ironborn sailing up and down the coast of Westeros, attacking ships and cities and carrying women and children back to the Iron Islands. Naval warfare is something that the Ironborn historically have enjoyed quite a bit. And occasionally, they'd venture farther in from the coast and attack landlocked communities as well. One of the more successful of these land-based campaigns was waged by a guy named Heron the Black who, a couple of decades before Aegon was born, had basically conquered the entire Riverlands and made it pretty clear to all the other kings and lords in Westeros that he was interested in conquering even more. But before doing that, right after he conquered the Riverlands, he decided to stop and build a castle for himself and his descendants. Earlier in this episode, I mentioned an island called the Isle of Faces. Well, the Isle of Faces is in the middle of this huge lake on the east coast of Westeros called the God's Eye. And this is where Heron the Black decides to build his castle. And not just any castle either. Heron wants to make the biggest, grandest, most impressive castle in the entire world. Now, slavery has always been outlawed in the Seven Kingdoms, period. It's a crime to participate in it. Doesn't matter if you're a lord or a king or a farmer, if you participate in slavery, you're going to get in serious trouble. However, if you conquer someone and then you tell them that they're going to help you build, say, a castle or you're going to kill them, well, that's perfectly legal. It's a bit of a loophole. And that's what Heron the Black does. He turns all of the Riverlands into one giant machine to build one giant castle. It's a place called Heron Hall. And 40 years after he starts construction, Heron's almost finished building it. And that makes the other kings in Westeros a little bit nervous. They know that as soon as it's done, odds are pretty good that Heron's going to pick up right where he left off. After all, the Ironborn have always wanted to be an independent, sovereign kingdom, and now that Heron the Black has a foothold on the mainland, they finally have enough farmland to supply a land army. If you're a king in Westeros when Heron Hall is completed, you have good reason to be worried. And the person who's the most worried about this is the king of the Stormlands, a guy named Argalac Durandon, the Storm King. The Stormlands border the Riverlands to the southeast, and Harrenhal, well, you know that saying of uh, Sarah Palin's, how she could see Russia from her front door? Well, you can literally see the Stormlands from Harrenhal's front door. They're right next to each other. And not only that, but at this point, the Stormlands aren't a particularly powerful kingdom. The Dornish have been raiding their southern border, and the Reach had been doing the same from the east. They were surrounded by hostile kingdoms, and over the years, the constant skirmishing and retaliation had taken a toll on the Stormlands' resources. Not only that, but the Storm King's not quite the king he used to be. When he was younger, he was a force to be reckoned with, successfully fought a lot of wars and all that. 
But at this point, he's getting up there in years, and he's just not the force that he once was. Heron the Black could roll right through the Stormlands if he wanted to, and there's nothing the Storm King can do about it. So, Argalak has a lot of good reasons to be concerned by the impending completion of Hall. Another hostile army on the Stormland borders might be more than his kingdom can take. So he starts looking around for help, and he decides to ask the guy who lives right off his shore on Dragonstone, Aegon Targaryen. Now, at this point, Aegon is 27 years old. He's the Lord of Dragonstone, which basically just means he's in charge, and again, he's also the only guy in the entire world who's got dragons. So if he wanted to, he could be a big help in any conflict. I mean, heck, if you didn't know he was just a couple of years away from being called Aegon the Conqueror, you'd be forgiven for seeking out his help. Argalak may be old, but he's no fool, and he recognizes that he needs to make an alliance with Aegon as soon as possible. So Argalak sends Aegon a message that basically says, Hey Aegon, if you marry my daughter, who's my only heir by the way, I'll give you the northwestern corner of my kingdom. At first glance, it sounds like pretty standard stuff. Marriages were a very common political tool in Westeros, and very frequently used to secure alliances. There were a couple of problems with Argalak's offer, though. First off, Aegon's already got not just one, but two wives. And second, the northwest corner that Argalak is talking about isn't really his kingdom. It's part of the Riverlands, which at this point in time belonged to Heron the Black. Although, on the face of it, Argalak simply forming an alliance, what he's really trying to do is use Aegon to create a buffer zone between the Stormlands and Heron the Black, and he's hoping that Aegon is too dumb to realize it. It's a very, very risky play, but Argalak doesn't have a ton of options right now. Either this alliance works out or the Stormlands are finished. Well, unfortunately for Argalak, Aegon is not dumb. He's been staring at that gigantic map of Westeros for years, and he knows just as well as anybody who lives on the continent where the parcel of land Argalak has promised him in the Dowry lies, and why Argalak might be comfortable parting with it. So Aegon sends back a counteroffer of, I'll tell you what, I've already got two wives, so how about you marry your daughter to my best friend, double the size of the Dowry, and you've got yourself a deal. The best friend that Aegon mentions is a bastard named Oris Baratheon. Now, when I say bastard in this story, it doesn't always mean someone who doesn't know who their parents are. It can also mean someone who's completely aware of who their parents are, but for whatever reason, the parents won't officially acknowledge them as their child. Remember, lineage is very, very important to the Westerosi. Chances are, if you have any wealth, it's inherited, and if you have any influence, it's normally because your father had wealth and influence, and his father had wealth and influence, and so on and so forth. That's not always the case. There's still room for really driven people like Peter Baelish, a you know, little finger, to rise up. But people like that are the exceptions, not the rule. And the vast majority of the time, your last name means an awful lot. There's all kinds of laws set up about what happens to a family's wealth when the patriarch dies. Normally everything goes to the eldest son, but there's a lot of stipulations about what happens if the eldest son can't hold a title or own any land, or if there isn't an eldest son at all, and any children born outside of a legally recognized marriage really throw a monkey wrench into the works. So for a lot of reasons, it's sometimes easier to say, well, sure, it's my kid, but it's not the kid that's going to inherit everything, so we'll just call him a bastard and let him be. In Westeros, being a bastard means you don't get your father's last name, regardless of whether or not your lineage is in question, and so you aren't his de facto inheritor once he passes away. And that has all kinds of political implications. The most important one for our story being that if you marry one of your daughters off to a bastard, her and her children don't really stand to benefit as much as if you married her to one of the recognized heirs of a family fortune. As it happens, Oris Baratheon is the bastard son of Aegon's father. And that not only makes him Aegon's half-brother, but it also makes him half-Targaryen, a point the Baratheons will use to try to claim the throne a few centuries from Aegon's time during the War of the Five Kings. And from all accounts, Aegon Targaryen and Oris Baratheon were inseparable. In fact, as far as people who study this kind of stuff can tell, Oris may have been the only friend that Aegon had. Now, in Westeros, there's a huge stigma against bastards. They're seen as a lower class from just about everyone else, and if you come from nobility, you risk sullying your entire family's reputation if you marry one. So when Argalak hears that Aegon has suggested marrying his only daughter to a bastard, well, he goes nuts. He sees it as an insult against the honor of his house and his daughter and his family and the Stormlands and all of that stuff. Now, like I said earlier, 
Arglak was a pretty famous warrior in his youth, but now he's a bit older. He doesn't get to fight that much. He doesn't have the same outlet for his anger anymore. So when he loses his temper, he really goes for it. And remember, the guy's already under a lot of stress. Offering his daughter's hand in marriage to Aegon was already kind of a Hail Mary play that most scholars agree wouldn't have been necessary if it weren't for Heron the Black setting up shop right next door. For Aegon to not only turn down his initial offer, but to offer a bastard in exchange? Well, that was just too much for Argilac to handle. And his response sets in motion a series of events that determine the course of Westerosi history for centuries to come. Aegon had sent an envoy to Argilac with his counteroffer, and for situations like this, that's pretty common. It's more personal than letting a raven fly off with a note, and besides, a lot of these envoys were very intelligent men who were well-versed in politics and history and diplomacy, and I guess you could just call them diplomats, but they lack any real power to do anything other than behave as their master's eyes and ears in far-off lands, but that's the kind of function they serve. And this isn't just a Westerosi thing, folks. Uh, Prior to the advent of Well, probably the telegraph, but prior to modern communications technology, if you wanted an important message sent somewhere securely, you sent an envoy. And because these envoys were so well-educated, that made them a valuable resource. And so any harm that befell them was taken very, very personally by the men they served. When Aegon Targaryen's envoy tells Argilac Durandon that Aegon has refused his daughter's hand in marriage and offered Oris Baratheon's hand in return, Argilac responds... Poorly. He gets so upset that he cuts the hands off of the envoy and sends them back to Aegon on Dragonstone in a box with a note that says, These are the only hands you will receive from me. Like we said earlier, nobody knows what Aegon's motivations for conquering Westeros were. But I bet that when he got those hands in that box, he gave them a long, hard look and started thinking about all the wars and violence that plagued Westeros and decided to put an end to it. Of course, maybe not. Maybe he was just insulted by Argilac and had one of the biggest overreactions in history. Maybe he had already been planning an invasion and the timing was just a coincidence. Whatever the case may be, right after he gets that box, Aegon calls a council of his closest friends and family. They spend seven days talking things over. And then... On the seventh day, a storm of ravens erupts from Dragonstone, each one headed for one of the great houses in Westeros. And every one of those ravens has a message tied to it that reads, There is but one king in Westeros. All those who disagree shall be destroyed. I mean, that's a great line, isn't it? All those who disagree shall be destroyed? That's how a conqueror responds to an insult, folks. Now, Keep in mind that to most of these great houses, Aegon is just some foreign guy who lives on a rock off the eastern coast. His family hasn't historically been any kind of a military threat. He doesn't have any armies. He doesn't have any allies. All he's got is three big flying lizards. And you know, something to keep in mind here is that the people of Westeros had never seen dragons in action before. I mean, sure, they'd heard of them in songs and stories and stuff like that, but they hadn't, say, learned the dragon-as-weapon lesson that the Valyrians taught the Gikari or the Roynish or the rest of Essos, for that matter. For all they know, the way dragons behave in the songs and stories could just be the losers of all those dragon battles trying to make themselves look better. Or maybe the dragons didn't even fight in battle. They just sat there looking mean, and all the mentions of dragons in the songs and stories were references to armies of houses who had dragons on their banners. And remember, a lot of them probably didn't know what triggered all of this. There wasn't, you know, C-SPAN running 24-7, telling all these lords about every little detail about what was going on on the other side of the continent. So most of them don't even understand that Aegon's envoy had had his hands cut off, and even if they did, for this Aegon character to all of a sudden proclaim that he's the king of all of Westeros and that he'll destroy all who oppose him? Well, it certainly sounds like a lot of hot air, if you'll excuse the pun. Also, when the kings and lords of Westeros look at what they've got going for them, Aegon seems like even more of a joke. I mean, they've got millions of citizens, thousands and thousands of knights, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, almost unlimited resources, and a long history filled with constant fighting that made them very, very confident in their military capabilities. They look at all of that, then they look at Aegon sitting alone on Dragonstone, and they ignore him. 
You know, I read a lot of history and I love figures like Aegon Targaryen or Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan or any of these other conquerors. And when you read a lot about these kinds of guys from all different times and places, you start to notice a few similarities. One of them is that conquerors really, really don't like to be ignored. And Aegon's no exception to that rule. When the lords of Westeros don't respond right away by, you know, demolishing political boundaries that have been more or less stable for a few millennia and handing the keys to the kingdom over to the first guy who asked for them, Aegon gathers his army, which is modest, about 1,400 soldiers, plus a small navy, and three dragons, of course, and he sets sail for Westeros. Um... And a quick note here about Aegon's two wives. The Targaryens were members of a club that's not unique throughout history. I I guess you could call it the Rich and Powerful Incest Club. You know, people in positions of power who thought that whatever allowed them to achieve that power was some innate genetic property, and so they better not marry outside the family, otherwise they might dilute that genetic property and not be able to hold on to the power they've got. I mean, this is why you have so many nobles throughout history who are obsessed with genealogy. If, uh, you know, say a Roman senator can say, well, my father was Tiberius and his father was Augustus and, oh yeah, by the way, his father was Julius Caesar, people might be more likely to listen to him. And so these people marry their cousins, sometimes their siblings, so as to not dilute the bloodline they derive their power from. And the Targaryens believe this, so whenever possible, they'd marry and breed within their own family in order to keep the bloodlines pure. Put yourself in their situation. You're the only family in the entire known world that can control dragons, and there's no way for you to know whether or not this son or that daughter will be able to, but by marrying within the family, you double your chances. I'm not saying I condone it, but I suspect that if any one of us were in that situation, we'd have to at least consider it, wouldn't we? Well, the Targaryens consider it, and wind up deciding that incest is a small price to pay for dragons. So Aegon's wives weren't just his wives, they were also his sisters. And not only that, but they were vital to his war effort, because each one of them controlled one of the dragons. You see, dragons, for, and I hate to keep saying this, but again, for reasons that nobody really understands, will only accept one master at a time. So say you're John Doe Targaryen, and you somehow manage to bond with a specific dragon. From the moment that happens until the moment you die, that dragon isn't going to let anyone else ride it or command it, ever. At the time of the invasion, the Targaryens had three dragons. Aegon's sisters rode two smaller dragons who had been hatched on Dragonstone named, uh, and I'm certain I'm butchering these names, but Vagar and Meraxes. And so far as dragons go, they were pretty good, but they were nothing like the dragon Aegon rode. Balerion, also known as the Black Dread. It's a massive creature that was over 100 years old and had actually traveled with Aenar from Valyria. That's the dragon that Aegon gets to ride, and Balerion is said to be so large it could swallow mammoths whole. Now, I'm no dragon expert, I and mean, nobody is anymore, but I couldn't believe that when I read it. I assumed that some meister working in the service of a Targaryen lord had trumped up the accounts of Balerion's size, but a painting commissioned by Aegon Targaryen himself shows him standing on Balerion, and well, it's just breathtaking. And according to modern scholars, if the dimensions of this painting are accurate, Balerion was 76 meters long. That's the size of a Boeing 747, and it spits fire. I mean, that should give you some idea of the the military advantage that Targaryens have going for them. So, Aegon and his little army and three dragons land on Westeros, on a hill that overlooks a bay called Blackwater Bay, and Blackwater Bay is one of these places that keeps popping up in the history of Westeros and in all different areas. It's a safe, deep bay, which means large ships can anchor there, and so it winds up being a fairly important piece of real estate, both commercially and politically, during pretty much whatever era you're looking at. Anyway, Aegon shows up and he builds a little encampment, he makes sure his army is provided for, that everyone is doing okay, everything's settled, And then he goes to war. The conquest itself lasts for about two years, but, you know, given the benefit of hindsight, we can just sum it up and say that the whole thing is just a massive success for Aegon. There's just nothing anybody can do to counter the military advantage that dragons give the Targaryens, and those who try to are destroyed. A lot of information has come down to us about Aegon's conquest. It's a little bit like the World War I of Westeros in that it's a completely different kind of war than anything that had come beforehand, and that really affected the people who lived through it. There's a famous battle from the conquest called the Field of Fire that, to me, illustrates how hard it is to fight against dragons. 
A few months into the conquest, the King of the West and the King of the Reach decide that enough is enough. This Targaryen fellow has caused enough trouble, and it's time for the grown-ups to step in and put an end to all this conquest talk. So the two kings join forces, get about 55,000 soldiers together, 5,000 of which are mounted knights. And sort of like in medieval Europe, mounted knights are, well, if the military were run like a professional baseball league, the mounted knights are the first-round draft picks. They're the heavy cavalry. For as far back as anybody in Westeros can remember, if you've got thousands of mounted knights and your opponent has maybe 10,000 soldiers, well, that's not even a battle. It's a slaughter. So the King of the West and the King of the Reach take a look at their army, and they take a look at Aegon's encampment on the Blackwater, and they march against him. They figure their 5,000 mounted knights can probably take care of his armies without sustaining any significant casualties, and then after that, they'd have over 50,000 troops versus three dragons, and dragon or no dragon, those numbers sound pretty good too. And at first, it looks like they might be right. This battle doesn't start out well for the Targaryens. 55,000 soldiers is a pretty sizable army after all. The Targaryens have a small fortress, but it was only recently constructed. It doesn't offer them much protection, and the other guys are fighting on their home turf. But then, for the only time in the whole war, Aegon and his sisters unleash all three of their dragons at once, and it's an absolute rout. They burn 4,000 soldiers to death almost instantly, and then turn the rest of the battlefield into an inferno, and devastate the armies of the Reach in the West. 10,000 soldiers suffered burns, one in every five men. The king in the west sees which way the wind was blowing, and he surrenders and swears fealty to Aegon. And that would be King Lorne Lannister, which is why the Lannisters are still the great lords of the Westerlands, all the way up from this time period to the War of the Five Kings. If they hadn't surrendered to Aegon, their entire bloodline would have been incinerated. And that's pretty much what happened to the king of the Reach, a man by the name of Myrn Gardner. Not only was he killed in the field of fire, but so were all of his sons. So there just weren't any more gardeners left to yield. Instead, their stewards, the Tyrells, yielded for them. As a reward, Aegon made the Tyrells the overlords of the Reach, and they've ruled there ever since. Already, just a few months into Aegon's conquest, there are families being put into power whose names will be all over the history books during the War of the Five Kings, and that's still several hundred years away at this point. A big part of the reason Aegon was able to conquer all of Westeros was that after the Field of Fire, word got out that, hey, you know, these dragons that Aegon has are more than just flying lizards. They're unstoppable killing machines that rain death from the sky. And well, after that, you start seeing a lot less tough talk from the kings and their lords. For instance, around the same time that the Field of Fire happens, Torin Stark, king in the north, is marching south with about 30,000 soldiers to do battle with Aegon. Now, remember, the North was the only place that the Andals couldn't conquer, and the Andals tried for a long time. The Northerners are a tough, tough people and not afraid of a fight. Well, on his way down to the war, Torrin Stark hears about what happened on the Field of Fire, and he realizes that there's no fighting against dragons. So when he meets Aegon's army, he requests a meeting with Aegon, and he bends the knee. Forever after, history will remember him as the king who knelt. He gives up his crown, swears fealty to Aegon and his descendants, and just like that, Aegon wins the entire north without killing anyone, and the Starks become major players on the world stage for the next few hundred years. Then there's Heron the Black, the ironborn who was so fearsome that Argilac Durandon tried to forge an alliance with the Targaryens in the first place. Heron the Black hears about the Field of Fire and has a wildly different reaction from everyone else. He basically tells Aegon to get lost, that he's never bending the knee to anybody, and nobody can get him because he's got the biggest castle on earth to hide in. Oh, and by the way, it's made out of stone, and stone doesn't melt, so go ahead and do your worst. You know, if you remember the story of the three little pigs, well, Heron's kind of like the third little pig sitting in his house of brick, and he's daring Aegon and his dragons to huff and puff and blow his house down. Which, I can sort of understand why he would say something like that. After all, Harrenhal is simply enormous. It doesn't even seem like a castle. It seems like a mountain that got lost and ended up next to a lake. Even if dragons are the best offensive weapon anybody's ever seen, Harrenhal's the best defensive structure you could ask for. Also, don't forget that Harren's on a winning streak so far as military victories go, which is why Harrenhal was even built in the first place. 
In fact, we're told that Heron moved into Heron Hall the same day that Aegon landed at the Blackwater. So this is not only an impregnable fortress, it's a brand new impregnable fortress that doesn't have a single turret out of place. It's an impressive defense, and when you combine that with the fact that Heron had a history of conquering anybody who messed with him, Aegon starts to look like he was just one more guy in a long line of people who thought they could take Heron out. Still, that doesn't change the fact that challenging someone with dragons is a spectacularly stupid thing to do. We're told that there's a parley before any fighting starts, and that during this parley, Aegon gives Heron the Black a chance to bend the knee. Swear fealty and the Iron Islands will be yours. Heron the Black turns Aegon down, and there's an absolutely phenomenal exchange between these two men that comes down to us by way of Meister Martin. Quote, What is outside of my walls is of no concern to me. Those walls are strong and thick. And then Aegon is said to reply, But not so high as to keep out dragons. Dragons fly. And now Heron again. I built in stone. Stone does not burn. And then Aegon with a great kicker. When the sun sets, your line shall end. End quote. I mean, that's chilling, isn't it? Imagine the kind of man Heron the Black must have been to hear that from a man who has three dragons at his disposal and still not back down. You know, there's an old quote about how the line between bravery and stupidity is so thin that you don't know you've crossed it until you're dead. And for me, that's Heron the Black in a nutshell. That night, Aegon sets out with Balerion, flies out over Harrenhal, and covers the entire thing in fire. We're told that almost everything flammable, grain reserves, livestock, people, went up almost instantly, and that according to troops stationed across the river, the stone walls Heron put so much stock in glowed and melted like candles. Heron and his entire family are trapped in a tower and burn alive, taking the family name Hor with them. Aegon frees the Riverlands from the Ironborn, and the Riverlands are given to a family by the name of the Tullys who had pledged to stand with him against Heron the Black. Edmund Tully will eventually serve as Hand of the King during Aegon's reign, and the Tullys will play a significant role in some major events in the history of Westeros that we'll get to in a little bit. But again, not to belabor the point, but during this conquest, Aegon is dictating the families that will be major players in Westeros for centuries to come. That's the kind of power dragons give you. As for Harrenhal, I mean, it's sort of like the Westerosi Titanic, right? It was supposed to be too big to fail, and then boom, right after it's finished, in its first fight, half of it gets melted to the ground. Well, people didn't react well to that. And it gains a reputation of being haunted by the spirits of Heron and his sons who were burned alive. And as for whether or not that's true, well, it probably depends on how willing you are to believe in things like curses and things of that nature. But what is true is that everyone who's occupied Heron Hall since Heron the Black has met with some misfortune or another. Either way, it's a pretty spooky place and a giant monument as to why you don't mess with dragons. And let's not forget about Argilac Durandon, the guy who ticked Aegon off in the first place. He's actually one of the first victims in this war, and he gets taken out, not by a dragon, but in the middle of an old-fashioned land battle between two armies, which, compared to the Field of Fire and the Burning of Harrenhal, seems awfully... pedestrian... But for those soldiers on the ground who still had a pre-dragon notion of what warfare was, it was a pretty impressive battle just the same. Right after the conquest began, Aegon gave his friend Oris Baratheon, you know, the bastard who Aegon proposed marry Argilac's daughter. Anyhow, he gives his pal Oris a few thousand troops, plus one of his dragons, and tells him to go take care of Argilac. So Oris marches out to the Stormlands and sets up shop right outside of Argilac's castle at a place called Storm's End. And... Like I mentioned earlier, Argilac used to be a famous warrior, so on some level, you gotta think that he was excited to, you know, see a little action again. So he gathers his army together, and he marches out to meet Oris in a battle that's ominously called the Last Storm. Now, there is a dragon at this battle, but by all accounts, it doesn't come into play too much. It's used more in a tactical support role for the ground troops, you know, scouting ahead and relaying information on the positions of Argilac's troops, rather than just, you know, scorching them from above. 
I've never been quite sure why Dragonfire wouldn't be the first thing any of Aegon's generals would deploy in a battle, but we're told that this particular battle was fought as a huge storm raged overhead. So perhaps that kept the dragon, uh, Meraxes was the dragon at this battle, I think, but perhaps the storm kept Meraxes from being able to be used accurately enough to just burn Argilax troops. I mean, even in the 20th century, weather is frequently a deciding factor in the deployment of aerial bombardments. I mean, just look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm just speculating here. I can't find anything in the original sources to back my theory up. Anyhow, Argalac Durandon and his host ride out to meet Oris Baratheon in the battlefield. And at some point during the battle, Argalac gets knocked off of his horse right in front of Oris Baratheon, and the two men wind up fighting in single combat. Argalac is slain by the very bastard he'd insulted to start this entire war, and when he dies, his troops surrender and the battle ends. Afterwards, Aegon gives the Stormlands to Oris as, well, basically as a thank you gift. And in a sort of interesting twist, or, or maybe ironic, I'm not sure, Oris ends up marrying Argilac's daughter. I mean, this was the union that Argilac was so insulted at the possibility of that he cut the hands off an envoy, triggering just, well, just an untold loss of life. And for what? His daughter winds up marrying Oris Baratheon just the same. And to his credit, Oris was so impressed by Argilac that he decides to keep all of the Durandon house customs. Same house words, same house sigil, same castle, Storm's End is the seat of his power. The only thing that he changes is the house name, which is why from that point forward, the Stormlands are ruled by the Baratheons, and who is and isn't a Baratheon will come to be, well, it'll be a central issue in the War of the Five Kings, as will the relationship between the entire Baratheon lineage and the Targaryens, but we'll get to that later. This sort of victory is basically how the entire conquest goes for Aegon. The only kingdom that presents any sort of real problem is Dorne, that desert kingdom to the south I mentioned earlier. They hear about all these battles that Aegon is winning, and they realize that there's no chance of success if you take the field against dragons, and there's no winning if you hide in your castle. So across the entire kingdom, people abandon their homes, abandon their castles, and melt into the hills, where they just hide out and refuse to engage in any sort of war with the Targaryens. And this seems to be the only sort of fighting that dragons have a problem dealing with. If you clump up 10,000 troops, the dragons can take care of that in a jiff, but they aren't particularly good at hunting down a lot of small groups hiding out in the landscape. I mean, you can't beat the enemy if you can't find the enemy, can you? Eventually, Aegon realizes that this one kingdom is more trouble than it's worth, and he leaves to deal with the other six. But for the rest of Aegon's life, he'll go back and try to bring it into his unified kingdom. He never quite does, which has got to be just... Well, it'd be frustrating, wouldn't it? To be able to take six kingdoms without sustaining any real losses, and then to just not be able to get the seventh one no matter what you do. Eventually, a few decades later, one of his descendants, a guy called the Young Dragon, is finally able to, but Aegon dies without ever being able to conquer Dorne. But aside from Dorne, the conquest is, all things considered, pretty easy going. And two years after Aegon set foot on that hill above the Blackwater, he's pronounced the first king of Westeros. And he's given a moniker that hopefully you'll understand. It's Aegon, first of his name, king of the Andals, the Roynish, and the First Men. It's like some Westerosi historian said, you know, this place has had so many different ruling cultures for so long that if we don't list them all right in the title, somebody's going to think you're not their king. And King Aegon Targaryen I winds up with this very, very impressive sounding title. And one of his first acts as king is his most interesting, at least to me. Aegon takes all the swords from the knights who opposed him. And so we're talking about thousands of swords here, probably hundreds of thousands, really. And he has Balerion melt them into one big pointy hunk of molten metal. And then he has that fashioned into a massive chair called the Iron Throne. Now, estimates differ. Meisters, Benioff, and Weiss seem to think that the Iron Throne stands a little higher than a tall man, about seven feet high, five feet wide, and that's a pretty impressive throne. But Meister Martin has a different estimate entirely, and when push comes to shove, I tend to side with Meister Martin on these little details. First off, Meister Martin tells us that it took a team of craftsmen 59 days to hammer the Iron Throne into place, and a painting that Meister Martin claims is the most accurate depiction of the Iron Throne that's come down to us depicts it as being so large that it absolutely dwarfs the two members of the Kingsguard standing at its base. I've seen this picture. You can go online and find it yourself. And the Iron Throne is just, well, it's awesome in the truest sense of the word. It looks to be nearly 40 feet high and has sharp pointed blades sticking out of it every which way. 
it's not just a throne fit for a king of the north or a king of the reach or one of these penny ante kingdoms that came before Aegon. The Iron Throne is a throne fit for the king of all Westeros. And the purpose of, well, of the throne, shall we say, unorthodox design is twofold. First off, it serves as a warning to anyone who might mess with Aegon or his descendants. It's a sort of giant blinking neon sign that says, hey, you see all these swords? Yours could go in here just as easily, you know. And second, it serves as a reminder that whatever king is in power, that he should never sit easy, that he should never rest, that he should always be on his toes. Because the Iron Throne is sharp, folks. Remember, it's got swords poking out of it in every direction, including in the back of the throne itself. No king that sits on the Iron Throne can just lean back, because if they do, they'll be stabbed in the back by the throne itself. And there are dozens of stories of various Targaryen kings getting hurt on the thing, and at least one recorded instance of the chair killing a king. I mean, you should really go online and look the thing up. It's this huge, weirdly beautiful mess that's just imposing as all heck. Another one of Aegon's first kingly acts is to form a new capital for Westeros. And he decides that it'll be where he began his invasion, on the hill above the Blackwater Bay. It's called King's Landing. And eventually it becomes the biggest city in Westeros. Oh, and he turns that little log encampment he made into a giant castle called the Red Keep. And the third thing he does that's interesting is he changes the Westerosi calendar so that it now hinges around B.C. and A.C., that's before conquest and after conquest. Sort of an Augustian-type move there on Aegon's part. You want to make sure everybody knows that you conquered everything? Put it right there in the calendar as year zero, and they'll know. You know, like we said earlier, there's a lot of uncertainty about why Aegon did what he did. But if his intention really was to bring stability to a continent that had long been ruled by war... Well, it sort of worked. For roughly 300 years after his conquest, so until roughly 300 AC, I suppose, the Targaryens are in power, and although there are certainly some bloody periods, it's nothing compared to what had happened before. By the standards of Westeros, it's positively tranquil, and that is absolutely the doing of Aegon and his dragons. In fact, even 150 years after Aegon lands, when the last of the Targaryen dragons dies, Westeros still remains as a cohesive political entity. And remember, the dragons were the only reason Aegon was able to make himself king. If ever there was a time for the realm to split back apart into seven actual kingdoms, that would be it. And yet, it doesn't happen. The last of the dragons die, and Westeros just keeps humming right along, putting one Targaryen on the Iron Throne after the next. Which, to me suggests that by that point, everyone had come to the conclusion that having one king, as opposed to seven kings, seemed to be a winning system. And if those kings all happen to be Targaryens, well, they're doing a pretty good job keeping the peace, so might as well reward them with a dynasty. And that's the way that things go for close to 300 years, which brings us within spitting distance of the War of the Five Kings, which begins in 298 AC. But the line of Targaryen kings doesn't quite make it that far. The last of the Targaryen kings is taken off the throne in 282 AC in a war called Robert's Rebellion, or, as some people call it, the War of the Usurper. Robert's Rebellion is an absolutely critical period in the history of Westeros because it's the first time since the Iron Throne was established as the seat of power for the entire kingdom that it was up for grabs, and everybody had a very different opinion on who should be sitting on it and why. Before Robert's Rebellion, there was no Game of Thrones, as Cersei Lannister would put it. The Targaryens had the throne and that was it. But once Robert Baratheon decides that the Targaryen kings aren't cutting it anymore, that changes. And from that point onwards, the great houses of Westeros will stop at nothing to take the Iron Throne. If you want to understand the alliances and factions at play in the War of the Five Kings, you've got to start with Robert's Rebellion. And that's just what we'll do in the next episode of Shadow 